Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar from zero to 50 Dynatrace growth stories. Thank you for taking the time and being here with us today. My name is Lisa, and I have the pleasure to lead you through the evening and introduce you to today's speakers. Let me briefly go through our agenda. First, we welcome Stefan Gusenbauer, our Hagenberg lab lead. He will give us some insights into the history and you will find out whether being in a temporary office with a team of two feels like ages ago and what growth will mean for the lab in the Software Park Hagenberg in general. Afterwards, we welcome Thomas Natschläger, our lead data scientist. He will give you some first-hand insights into his data-driven world of influencing the strategic direction and development of data science and AI solutions at Dynatrace. Martin Cabella, product architect at Dynatrace, will bring us home with an inspirational story in how getting his hands dirty as a senior software engineer led him to become the go-to person for conceptual solutions. We will be running a live Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Please join us on Slido using the link or just scanning the QR code. So if you have any questions, just pop them in there. And if you miss anything, don't worry, we'll be sharing the on-demand recording when it's ready. So now without further ado, we will hand things over to Stefan, our first presenter of today. Yeah. Um... Thanks for the nice introduction and hello and welcome uh, to our webinar. Um, before I dive into my short bio, um, I want to give you a brief overview about Dynatrace. Uh, so, yeah, um, we evolved from a, let's say, a small uh, client server software uh, product company um, to a big software product company with about uh, 2K plus employees all over the world. We were founded in 2005 in Linz, Austria. And yeah, this is an old story, but a good story. So um, not like a typ typical Silicon Valley startup somewhere in the garage. So in Austria, the winters are cold. So it was in a proper flat, <laughs> small, but nice. And yeah, currently we're spread over like um, different locations in Austria, uh, in Detroit, in Barcelona, in Gdansk. And we evolved from, and Lisa, please, next slide, um, from, as I said, from a simple uh, simple application performance monitoring tool to a full stack software intelligence platform uh, where we serve a lot of cloud customers like this, just to name a few, Amazon, <clears throat> eBay, Bank of America, BMW, Ford, um, you name it. So if you have, let's say, um, then business in the internet, say it, you purchased something or something that you probably came across Dynatrace already. And yeah, uh, we try to make software like just working. Yeah, and with that, um, I want to go uh, to the next slide, please, and give you a short bio of myself and give you a bit of background why I, I like working with Dynatrace. So I, took your two pictures. So I had a very classical education in computer science studies at the JQ, uh, Johannes Kepler University uh, in Linz, and was also a former part-time lecturer in Hagenberg. I'm a Dynatracer since 2007, so I've uh, been in a company some time around, and I always tell people I grew up in the Java backend. So I started as a shop software engineer and doing their software engineering so really like uh shift shuffling data from here to there um doing the java backend for our data back then and then i became a team captain so um, i was uh, part uh, together with my team uh, part of designing the first uh, uh ai engine and a few years later then i became development led uh development lead sorry um for um, the Dynatrace cluster. And about two and a half years ago, I became the, I got a chance to um, build up the lab in Hagenberg. So I became a lab lead. And um, this is something, um, yeah, where I 
let's say back from like having 10 teams to two people at the beginning in a small temporary office being some sort of a check of all trades like um, providing proper infrastructure for people there um, having desks and also having the proper uh, technological direction um, be responsible for the growth, be responsible for a build out. Yeah, as I said, check of all trades, you name it. And please to the next slide. And this is somewhere, um, I want to put some numbers in. So this is, the title of the, the webinar is how to grow from zero to 50. And I would also say, aka, uh, why I like to work at Dynatrace. And um, as well, quite technical people, I augmented these pictures with some numbers. <laughs> so um, it's about from a few kilobytes to a few terabytes. So Thomas Natschlager will, let's say, have probably some more exact numbers later on. However, when I started at Dynatrace, we were shifting around, I don't know, one kilobyte from one agent, something like that. And no one ever thought about the terabyte or something like that. And just a I think two years ago, I gave a, a lecture uh, or a presentation at an occasion at the FH Hagenberg, and there I, I made a calculation, a simple one. And back then, Game of Thrones was still on air. So two years ago, we were shuffling around about 300 gigabytes per second over our cloud infrastructure, just this number. So, and then we make this conclusion like this relates to about 300 Game of Thrones episodes, full episodes in HD per second. So this is the scale. And also like from two releases per year, you probably saw here, the see here uh, the nice picture on the, yes, it was a CD, not a DVD. Um, so we shipped uh, basically stuff on CD-ROMs back then. Uh, <laughs> Uh, from two releases per year with all the crunch time involved and stuff like that to 300k releases per day. Guess what? They are automated. So it just happened. And the next number is from zero to 50. So this is the title of the webinar. And this is really like we started from zero from idea here to grow a lab in Hagenberg to 50 uh already almost 50 engineers i think it's end of may we will have this 50 engineers so that's really cool and so you get all the twists in there it's really hyperscale so we really have big technical hyperscale challenges and also like this organizational stuff that's really cool and we all work together and these are such some pictures you see here like from a cd now to terabytes something like that and that as an engineer by heart that makes me really can you go to the next slide and what i also want to share is um this is not like how to grow a lab you can call it how to grow a lab or how to have fun at work so it's all it's three pieces three parts how you call it it's the people so i'm really like the people i'm working with so we all work together on one product, the program, a programming technology, the task we have. So what's really super cool for me is like, we make software for software in a hyperscale environment. So our problem domain is really like software and that's really cool. So this is somehow uh, what really makes me, yeah, what's really challenging and the place it's, Okay, currently everyone is in home office, but you see the cool Zoom background in the back. See here the pictures. And you see here uh, us two standing together with a beer in the, at the construction site. This nice picture, we had to fix some stuff in the temporary office because power outage. And yeah, how can we get people out of the office? So we had to manually open the door. And here you see really, the place we are now. And so this is really like, it's a set, three people. And this is where it gets a bit inconsistent. I add a fourth ingredient and it's the motivation. It's fun, it's happiness. And to be honest, um, motivation doesn't mean for me, 
like, okay, doing overtime or stuff like that. For me, it's having fun at work, having fun by doing my work. And this is really cool. And this is, um, even if I, let's say you saw that the, the line from a software engineer, I going more and more towards like the, the management, uh, people management stuff, but it's always the challenge, the hyperscale challenge and the motivation behind the people, a lot of motivated people. And that's really cool. And this is yeah why I like to work at Dynatrix. And then I hand over. Oh, very cool. Thank you, Stefan, uh, for the insights into Dynatrix, the Hagenberg Lab and its growth story. Amazing. Uh, now we are handing over to Thomas, please. Thomas, you need to unmute you, please. <laughs> oh, sorry. I thought you would do that for me. Sorry. Um, yeah. Hello, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Thomas Natschläger. And in the following minutes, I would like to share with you uh, my background and my journey towards Dynatrace and my encouraging journey in at Dynatrace. So, um, What's my background, where I'm coming from, and why does it basically make, uh, does it make like a person like me, which is not originally started not studying uh, software science, ending up in a software science, uh, in a software engineering company. Um, I actually did my master's in telematics at the Technical University in Graz, which is more like in information uh, um, and mathematics uh, studies there. And back then, uh, during my master's, I kind of already fall in love with machine learning. Um, and the professor back then also had a quite strong connection to the area of computational neuroscience. And so this area of neural networks and studying the brain came nicely to, together such that I did a PhD in uh, computational neuroscience there. And when I did this computational neuroscience, I had to do a lot of simulations and Back then, I started my interest in designing and also actually implementing large-scale neural simulation programs, uh, which I did then. And data which was falling out of these simulations had to be analyzed. And then we start as we started to use machine learning for that. That was actually my, let's say, the starting point of my data-driven journey towards Dynatrace. Um, after I did my PhD and some teaching at the university in Graz, uh, at some point I decided I would like to make a slight move towards industry. And what I ended up doing is actually here in Hagenberg at the Software Competence Center Hagenberg, um, doing applied machine learning and data science research of, in the areas of um, mechatronics, of um, renewable energy, of uh, predictive maintenance, in, in, in applied areas, what the larger companies here in Upper Austria do, so machine, fact, machine manufacturers and things like that. Um, so uh, this I was doing for uh, basically 15 years here in Hagenberg. And um, somewhere two years ago, I kind of met Stefan and some other persons, which made me think of why not taking an even closer st step uh, towards industry and trying to do what I did in the research and development community directly for an interesting and large uh, software uh, company. And that's the reason, and I was looking at Dynatrace and said, okay, that looks like uh, challenging things you to do. And uh, yeah, that's the reason why I actually applied then here uh, at Dynatrace. Um, before I go into what I like about Dynatrace and what I'm actually doing here, I would just mention that I'm also kind of still doing some side projects, which are quite related, I would argue, with my, uh, with my um, duties here at Dynatrace. I'm a lecturer at the FH Hagenberg, where I teach uh, predictive analytics for the Internet of Things, and um, also kind of machine learning engineer for a small weather forecasting company, uh, where I do machine learning engineering uh, with, uh, let's say, in, on, in the Python area. And that's actually also but one of my largest written software applications, uh, which I maintain basically on my own, uh, stems from, which is this local weather forecasting system, which now over the last, I don't think, 10 years has grown over to something like 150K lines of Python code. But I'm not also, 
I mean, and one thing I want to point out, um, which kind of, let's say, uh, relates to the technical spirit, which is here at Dynat Races. Um, one thing I did in the very early days was my first, I would say, significant piece of software, which was actually a Pac-Man game written in machine byte code. Um, and I mentioned that because when you work at Dynatrace and talk with people there, they're all having the side projects and doing funny and interesting things at their home, which is uh, related to their work and the other way around. So it's a very uh, inspiring, um, let's say, environment here. Yeah, and now I would like to tell you actually what I find very interesting here in Dynatrace and why I actually ended up here. I think one of the most, one of the uh, reasons, one of the top most reasons why I'm here is because I'm a curious person. And a curious person is actually uh, like new fields of activity and new fields of research. And this was what I saw as quite a nice opportunity when I first learned about Dynatrace. Because there is um, so many things to explore, uh, so many different areas where Dynatrace is active. And also, um, the opportunity which was offered actually by Stefan to me was kind of building up the data science research, data science research and development um, uh, groups here in Hagenberg. Uh, and that is what I was doing over the last two years together with Stefan, growing this group from basically one person up to 14 persons as of now. And kind of a nice um, uh, other development here at Dynatrace is the Dynatrace recently built out the Dynatrace Research Lab at the Open Innovation Center near the JQU, where I'm also in clo close relationship with Andreas Hammetten, who is running that research lab. And we have a, a tight uh, relationship there. Some of the research, some of the work we need for our machine learning applications here in Dynatrace, we basically have a pre-research at the research lab, and then we will take it over into our development stream. Another thing, why I'm here at Dynatrace is because I'm a lazy person. A lazy with that a meaning, uh, I don't like to do repeated stuff. And when I first uh, met people here in Dynatrace, I first already got the impression Dynatrace at every end is trying to automate the hell out of everything. So in a very, I'd say tough words here, but um, really when you look around how the whole software engineering and all these processes are set up, Everything, everybody seeks to automate everything. And that's uh, really uh, comes with my spirit because when I have to do something three times in a row, which is the same, uh, I get bored here. So that's a, a perfect fit, I would say. And um, yeah, as I already mentioned in my introduction, 25 years ago, I felt, I felt already like I like data as yes? uh, complex data, big data, linked data, heterogeneous data, homogeneous data, valuable data, whatever. And uh, looking around at the uh, various data sources which are interested into the Dynatrace product, uh, Stefan already mentioned some numbers in the area of, I think now it's close to one terabyte per second, which is, uh, which is uh, processed there. Uh, so you can see there is a lot of opportunity for people which like data, I would argue. And last but not least, I also like, really like machine learning. Um, and what I actually like is the automation of machine learning. So typically, a uh, few years ago, when you think about machine learning applications and, and, you think, and when you read mach machine learning research papers, it's often the case that there is a dedicated machine learning problem. A group of people or one, one person sits down and spends something like, I don't know, uh, three months working on a dedicated machine learning problem and comes up with a uh, let's say handcrafted solution for that particular problem. Uh, what we are facing here at Dynatrace is actually the, the thing that we would like to integrate machine learning into our product and it should run for many, many different clients for many different applications in an automated way. So we would like to have machine learning pipelines in the product, which we don't have to babysit. So they should just work with, as le with a low number of configuration steps. And this is something, um, a challenge which I really like. And this kind of non-babysitted machine learning challenges we have in the area of forecasting, anomaly detection, clustering, time series clustering, you name it. There's lots of uh, opportunities for, a, let's say, a data research oriented guy like me there. And last but not least, oh, 
last but not least. I also really like software engineering as such and actually coding. So, um, and um, Dynatrace is, as a software development company, I think very, very strong on that. It, we're automating everything and try to do, as Stefan always said, do more with less. And especially in my area, we're uh, developing high performance machine learning applications uh, where we really uh, try to focus on per, uh, performance algorithms. So developing those performance algorithms um, for several of our applications, um, out of the box algorithms simply don't work. And so we have a, an, a quite, quite a challenge here also on the, let's say on the coding and software engineering part, not only on the research part for the algorithm side. And now it's really last but not least, I like nice tech safety colleagues. As I already mentioned, we're here at now a nice um, office here in Hagenberg. When you sit together with them over the coffee or over lunch, there's always chats about some new stuff somebody discovered the, the other day on, on some uh, on some tech trend channel or wherever, and um, um, talks about these tech things are ongoing. And there's a lot of uh, let's say technical spirit there, which I like a lot. Yeah. Um, I hope you got some uh, insights from my information why I am at Dynatrace and why I like Dynatrace. And yeah, with that, um, I hand back to Lisa. Thank you very much, Thomas, um, for sharing this with us. Last but not least, we have Martin on the turns. Uh, Martin, please go ahead and give us some insights into our your career path at Dynatrace. Yeah, hi everybody. My name is Martin. I'm a product architect here at Dynatrace. Uh, to understand, the product architects team is responsible for all the non-functional requirements uh, of the product. That, on the one hand, converting business and PM requirements into a working product keeping in mind how to scale all this, uh, keeping in mind how to improve and make it more efficient, and also keeping in mind how it can be maintained for a quite a long time. So let me tell you a bit about myself, about my professional background. Uh, I've spent the last 20 years of my life, which is basically all my professional life in or near Hagenberg. It started when I studied software engineering for medical purposes here at the University for Applied Sciences uh, from 2000 to 2004. Um, I also spent some time at the uh, FH's R&D labs and then became self-employed in 2005. Um, my main background then was developing Java and Microsoft.NET, basically more Microsoft.NET. In 2007, I started my second study, which was information engineering and management. Uh, while this was still ongoing in 2008, I joined what is now named Count IT Group here in Software Park in Hagenberg. Uh, there I worked on some major infrastructure changes and introduced Microsoft NAV uh, at the company, uh, also keeping the IT infrastructure of some quite big Austrian customers up and running. Uh, 2009, I joined Apex Gaming, which had just opened its development lab here in Hagenberg. And there I had a senior development and team lead role, uh, did a really lot intense work of software engineering in embedded systems, Java-based applications, mobile applications, security, encryption, temper protection, chain of trust, you name it. Uh, but more and more, I got into a lot of organizational and legal work in regards to certifications and uh, compliance. And the shift in my focus from, from a technically into more and more management role and in a compliance role was something I could not see myself in forever. And so in 2019, I decided that I needed a new focus. And uh, when I finally reached the point that I wanted to change companies, I applied only at one company and that was Dynatrace. And I was lucky enough that they accepted me and I now can share this story with you, uh, yes. And that's why I want to go on why I chose Dynatrace. Um, I've had heard about Dynatrace for several years up to this point an increasing number of people I knew from my time at the university had already joined. 
and they all reported positive things, uh, things about the product, things about the company culture, about the teamwork, things about the challenges they were facing. And I quite often thought to myself, wow, that's something really big they're building there. Don't get me wrong, I deployed my software previously to tens of thousands of embedded devices as well, and a crash there would have cost my company and um, our customers quite a lot of money. But that was really, really peanuts in comparison to the scale Dynatrace was operating at. Um, having a deployment every two weeks instead of once or twice a year, which we had in the previous company, really continuously every two weeks with the code that was being developed, injected into millions or most likely even billions of processes at the core operations of our customers, where crashing those would really crash giants of the industry and that was a scale that was a challenge that was something i wanted to be part of i've had put off applying at dynatrace for a time due to personal reason uh, reasons because i hesitated i didn't want to commute to linz every day i valued my work working here or near hagenberg very much but the turning point came when i by pure chance met Stefan at the celebration for 25 years uh, anniversary of software engineering at the university in Hagenberg. Uh, and uh, I knew Stefan from back at the time when I was self-employed and Stefan was still a student. And uh, we talked and then Stefan told me and said, hey, by the way, we are going to open up a lab in Hagenberg. And for me, then it clicked and wheels started to turn in my head. And I thought to myself, well, a new lab at a cool company and at the location I wanted to work in and where I wanted to stay. Building a lab up felt very much like building a new startup with a startup spirit, but uh, with a company in the background so that they would not have to worry about the funding of the whole thing. So yes, uh, I heard from my colleagues that this was a company where development and developers were seen and appreciated and that the challenges of software development were understood up to the sea level of sea um, level management so yeah and by the way when i said startup spirit if you look at the picture on the right yes it turned out to be true that's actually our mobile internet for meetings while we were still at the temp office so startup spirit all the way uh so I finally applied with a heavy heart, I have to confess, because I felt loyal to my previous company and because I really, really liked, well, actually still like my previous colleagues. Uh, the application process, once I started it, I have to say was a very smooth and a very well positive experience for me. They were professional all the ways, contact with recruiting, the interview itself, talking and arguing with legal. Uh, the first interview became a very interesting technical discussion within a matter of minutes, and I knew that I had chosen the right company to apply, to apply it, and that this was actually something I really, really wanted. The second round of interviews just confirmed my bias, and I was excited and happy when I received the offer, and I accepted it then without a second thought. So now I want to come to my career inside Dynatrace. You see, uh, I had applied as a senior software engineer for the Java backend. And um, after spending the last few years doing certifications, legal documents, requirements, and management tasks, I wanted to get back to my roots and to do what I enjoyed most. And that's actually developing the software, writing the code. Uh, when I joined Dynatrace, itself was investing very much in scaling a central part of our storage, what we call the monitored entities. Uh, at the time, we were getting bigger and bigger customers, which increased the amount of data we wanted to store and query really by orders of magnitude. The previous way those monitored entities were stored was not ready for that scale. My onboarding was part of the team that should fix those performance issues and make Dynatrace usable uh, with several tens of thousands of monitored servers, including monitoring hundreds of thousands of processes and uh, services inside a single monitored environment. And that was an intense experience, but a very rewarding one from a technical uh, perception. Uh, my first contribution to the code, which I had actually checked in, I think the second day of my employment, uh, reached customers three to four weeks later. 
And it was great feeling following the dashboards to see that the feature was used and even more to hear in, an, in the upcoming reviews that there was positive feedback from the early adopters. That was uh, something unknown to me with the slow re release cycles before. Uh, it was a team effort, of course, not my personal praise, but I still felt very uh, proud and enjoyed it very much. So while I enjoyed being a software engineer once again, I still could not resist to offer my opinions on all sorts of things, even if not directly related to my current task. Uh, as a result, I was included in more and more discussions about how we should build things and what things we should actually build for the scale we were aiming at. And what was so refreshing for me at Dynatrace was that the input from anyone on almost any topic was welcome. It didn't matter when you joined, how much seniority you had, if you were a part-timer or you like me had just joined the company, uh, if you had concerns, if you had ideas, someone would listen, take these things into consideration, uh, value the input, discuss it, review it. Well, of course, sometimes reject it, uh, but way more often, agree that it's a good idea and we should follow up on that. Uh, everyone in the company I interacted with from fellow software developers to architects to product managers, they all had a very deep understanding of the technical issues at hand. There was no way to swindle yourself out of a meeting with a high level product manager because you thought you could just throw in some buzzwords and be done with it. Ideas were welcome, but they were challenged and that was really good. So the team uh, that with me started in the newly found Hagenberg Lab, uh, as I said, was a very small office in the Arbeiten und Wohnen for those of you who know Hagenberg. Uh, we took over the responsibility for monitored entities and it was a mixture of experienced Dynatrace developers and new hires like myself. We coded, we sprinted, we delivered. That was a real pleasure and a real great feeling again. Uh, besides that, we also tried to kick off our developer community feeling. We made short technical presentations about any interesting topics. It was almost a little bit Buckham style. During coffee breaks, we talked a lot, a lot about our families, our hobbies, but even more about any interesting technical challenges we were working on, very similar to what Thomas mentioned before. Uh, and since the number of people in the lab started to grow steadily, we had a lot of topics to discuss. And for me personally, people noticed that they had opinions and ideas about a lot of different topics, and apparently not all of those ideas were nonsense and were taken into consideration. Uh, so more and more I got involved in technical discussions all over the lab, uh, up to a point where that took up a considerable amount of my time. And that was again a very striking experience for me to notice that no one was angry with me for not doing the job I was assigned to. It was on the contrary, really appreciated that I tried to enable and push ahead things outside of my direct responsibility. I was even encouraged to keep on doing that and no one was there to tell me, hey, you ought to code and not to talk. So after about a year and a half, I was approached by the product architects team and asked if I wanted to join the ranks and continue what I was doing already on the side, but this time as my main job. And so now since beginning of April, I officially started my role as product architect here at Dynatrace, which is a challenge again, yet a very rewarding one. Uh, one I was not considering when I, uh, when I started here at the company, but something I simply grew into and which I now enjoy very, very much. While, as you can see on the slide, this brings me again away from my beloved IDE, more towards more meetings and PowerPoint presentations, I can still contribute on a very technical level and build and shape the product together with all the teams in a way I never dreamt of before. And I'm quite confident that the scale we are operating at is quite unique for Austria. And the challenges this brings, brings also a lot of joy to me as a developer at heart. So yeah, that's basically what I wanted to share with you. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions you want in the upcoming Q&A.
Thank you, Martin, for sharing your story with us. And uh, now um, we are heading back to Stefan uh, to wrap it up, please. Yeah, um, again, thanks for, for staying in the line and uh, for listening. And um, yeah, I even if I know Thomas and Martin, uh, let's say for, for a very long time, I really enjoyed again wrapping up the stories. And I hope uh, you got a bit of uh, a glimpse uh, how this is to work at Dynatrace and also um, let's say what our challenges are and where our like um, where our motivation comes from and and why we really enjoy that. And um, with that, I think we can start presenting the questions. I already saw two coming in and yeah, feel free. Okay, there's also one. Uh, one question soon uh, i will answer that later on so i will because the two on uh in slider were before um i think the first uh so lisa should i or yes <laughs> so, sorry all good <laughs> I, I hijacked the script <laughs> no so, worries um uh, so the first question what are the three top skills and competences you need to require for every engineering position um, that's a tough question. I think, uh, let's say, I, I think we do that together. <laughs> so I think everyone has different opinions there. But for me, it's curiosity. Um, it's about looking like what's behind. Look, okay, you can't see my phone. So what's really be behind? So scratching the surface, not just being on the surface, really like what's digging into it like what's going at behind the scenes. So having a, a natural sense of curiosity and and also be open for feedback. That's very, let's say, um, um, important for me. So be a communicative guy, girl, and also be curious about things. Martin, Thomas, maybe you can add some. Yeah, you know, for for me and my experience, it's of course what you said of uh, a basic grasp of and understanding of the principle of software development never is wrong. That yeah. I take as a precondition for for applying at such jobs. Um, I don't think it's really knowing one language or one. Uh, one framework anymore we the world has shifted away from that in the recent years quite a lot i think you need to adapt fast and be able mm -hmm. to 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 tackle challenges with the best tools but for me the most besides the basic technical requirements is compatibility on a team level that's that's what i look into most when doing interviews is will we have a famous question here, and this is, would you go to a beer with this person? And mm -hmm. we should answer this with yes. <laughs> so, yeah. What, one thing I would like to add is, despite the, I mean, it comes close with curiosity. It's really, if I would, if I would say it in a bold sentence, you shouldn't be afraid of changes. Um, kind of, because now, as, as of now, Dynatrace is trying to reinvent itself, trying to develop already. I think, uh, Stefan, correct me, but we, we are internally talking about the third generation of the product, right? So uh, when, I, when I joined the company two years ago, there was some rumor that there will be a third generation, but now we are full steam into the development of the third generation and technology is changing fast. And uh, yeah, I mean, in general, it's, that's true in the IT, com in the IT community, I, I would say but also the, the speed uh, which is taken by the Dynatrace leaders to make the company compatible with this speed of change uh, is cool. And, but you are not allowed to be afraid of it. So that's, that's something uh, I would like to add here. Mm -hmm. I hope we, let's say, uh, answered this question to, to Anonymous <laughs> in the right manner. <laughs> um, I go to the next. 
Um, okay, this was upvoted. Um, so is the whole lab working a true Scrum setup? Um, yes uh, and no. <laughs> That's the easy answer here. Um, so we're doing an HL setup um, and we're not, like, we're not having a, a very strict style of Scrum. So every team has its own flavor. We have a, a dedicated, you can call it department, whatever, dedicated HL coaches who have like a big toolbox to give you like the choice of the different possibilities on how to organize your work. But what is in common, we have a two week sprint cycle where we release like these major things. And so, yes. Um, and every team is, is picking like their bits and pieces who fits well. However, it's all within the framework. So Thomas, Martin, maybe you can add some, I, I, saw, I saw nods. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I will answer this question together with the, the Zoom question, the most difficult challenge you faced. So in Zoom was also a question who is quite similar. So you scale from zero to 50, what worked well and what are you proud of and what you would you differently if you had to do it again. And, and the same thing is what was, I think it's, it's in the same direction. What was the most difficult challenge you faced while scaling from zero to 50 in place? Um, at first, uh, I have to say, it's not that just I'm proud of, I think the whole team can be proud of. So these are the people who see here in the, in the, in the, in the webinar, however, also the people who let's, okay. Like being part of this challenge. And so the whole team can be proud of. And this is, this is very important for me. So it's not just me scaling that, it's the whole team. And this is the whole team can be proud of. And I think is uh, um, what's one of the most difficult challenges is keeping everyone on the same page. So I, I, I even noticed that like when we were in the temporary office, when we were two people, it was easy because I was talking over the, over the monitor and to the guy sitting next to me and say, hey, want to do this and that. And immediately we became three people in the office. You saw the information flow hmm. slightly degrading and you can, you can scale that with the people. And so having a healthy information flow and having everyone on the same page, that's a very difficult task. And I think we managed that uh, to, I think, a very good uh, extent. However, it can always be better. So this is, for me, the, the biggest difficult challenge besides left uh, acquiring, checking where, where to hire people. And it's not about like, OK, scaling in, in terms of people, the number of people. So this is that's difficult, but Let's say that's not a challenge. You have also have topics for that. And, um, and I think so um, having the right people in the lab, and I think can say that for everyone, this is really like what makes me, and I think the whole team proud that we act together, even if we work on different topics and whatever, and different technologies, whatever. So this is really like, I am really proud of and the team can be proud of. And with that we do that together as a team. And, yeah, even the move, like we moved from the first first building to the second building that we did by ourselves. And this was team effort. And just these simple things, they work. And that's, I'm proud of the team. Is this somehow answered, I hope? Uh, I need to check this. Um, if you would describe it as a pie chart, how much how much percentage would you prefer candidate soft skills and how much engineering skills? That's a tough question. I would say at least 50-50. <laughs> uh, 
um, and because technical excellence is is important, yes, but it's also very important to be able to communicate, and this will require soft skills. If you have a good idea, as Martin says, um, they, it will be challenged, and you need to communicate that in a reasonable manner. And this is this is something for me. I I would say 50-50. And as said, Martin, you have to have a proper um, how should I call it a, a proper technical education for that, regardless which university, which curriculum you take, you have to have this technical foundation. But you have also, on the other hand, having the soft skills. That's very important. So I would say, yeah, 50 50, um, even more on the soft skill side, because technical skills you can upskill. Thomas, Martin? Um, I, I mean, it also depends on kind of what soft, what what what, what yeah. is all falls under soft skills. But you already earlier mentioned this curiosity and, and, uh, and let's say the the general mindset how to approach different things. This is something I personally uh, like to see. So, for example, um, I I always like people which kind of challenge me when you have some when you have some idea people starting exploring that idea and i really like getting okay somebody who, who really challenges this idea thinking as, as stefan said scratching the surface these things i think uh, are really important uh, to to be innovative otherwise you just do your task and if you're not questioning what task you are doing it's it, it's kind of uh, uh, suboptimal I agree. <laughs> um, the next, how is work-life balance? Um, yeah, I answered it. So mm -hmm. maybe I'm a good example for that because uh, even though many people forget it, I'm a part-timer. I'm only working 30 hours a week to, be, to have time for my family, which I value very much. And that's never been an issue. That's all I want to say here. Thanks. And, and I, I want to add something there. Um, and um, as, as Thomas said, um, we, we are constantly re ourselves. So one thing to put up front is, so um, I already stated that in some, some, some discussions. So, a Dynatrace, the backlog will ever be full. So there will be no empty backlog. There is always plenty of work. However, as we like uh, release to our big customers every two weeks, we can't afford a continuous crunch time. This is, this is something, yeah, which simply doesn't work. And um, this is something um, I want to stress. So there's always plenty of work. However, we see like you can just do your amount of work. And this is, as, as Martin said, we, 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 we want to evaluate that. And, and I also say one, one, one very, let's say, provocative statement. And in order to be in, in order to innovate and to produce quality work, you have to, have, you have to be sometimes bored. I say it in this like rather rude sentence, but you have to be systematically bored at some time to be innovative. If you're always drowning the day-to-day -day work, you can't be innovative. And currently we're like a set search gen and there we need innovation. And I don't say we need bored people, <laughs> but you get, I hope you get the, 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 the sense. So we, 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 yeah, we want to honor that, and, and that, that's very, very important for us. Um, Maybe I jump in. Sorry, Guzi, because we have uh, Zoom questions as well. Um, mm -hmm. How was remote work so far for Dynatrace, and what are the processes put in place to keep teams in sync? Yeah, um, maybe I start from the high level part and Thomas and, and, and Martin, you can add some, some mm -hmm. flavors from the teams. Um, for, 
from a technical side, it was easy, to be honest, because it was just, I think we bumped our, our uh, VPN a bit from, from one gigabit to two gigabits or something like that. So this was just, uh, let's say, a click in the web form of, of our internet service provider. Um, and yeah, we are used to work on different locations. However, as for every company, it was a challenge um, to stay in sync. We have our lab meetings now a bit differently organized and stuff like that. And having like proper Zoom meetings, you have to do some stuff a bit more structured. Probably you miss this, this under the hood information flow when you meet at the coffee machine or something like that. That's something you need to do more structured. And I think it works quite well. However, there's always room for improvement. You can call that uh, like, I don't know, but um, yeah, for sure. Some, some stuff is, is working very well. How we see for sure that like having a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation is something like is different than having a Zoom call. That's for sure. But I think we we till now we we did pretty well in that. So Thomas and Martin, maybe you can add something there. Yeah, I mean, I just would like to share my experience because actually, uh, when um, when COVID started last year in March, uh, the data science team was uh, three or four people at that time, and we had actually to onboard. Uh, we we onboarded actually I think six or seven people now during. Uh, the COVID, uh, uh, COVID crisis without physical onboarding, more or less all kind of remote and via Zoom. And as, as Stefan said, we actually tried to coordinate kind of virtual coffee times there. Um, originally, when, when, the, when we um, started the onboard, the, the, let's say the heavier onboarding last year in May, we actually had each day we had the stand up daily, the daily stand up meetings, obviously in the morning, but then also in the afternoon we had, we called it afternoon sync meetings, where we just uh, a few of them we devoted to upcoming technical issues, and the other ones were actually dedicated to causal things. Uh, we <laughs> um, funny fun story to share is we have one uh, team member with who all actually brought up kind of causal questions which have been to discussed there because it was actually in the, in the phase where we had three new people and we never met in person. So to really foster the social uh, collaboration there and, and having this, uh, this kind of um, things in place helped us to, to come together as a team. And now after one year, um, basically in this setting, I have to say uh, from, from the data science team, it, it worked out as good as it can work out when you're in, under these restrictions, I would argue. Yeah, my side, from the social aspects, I can completely agree with like maybe a little bit to add from the technical point uh, of view. Uh, of course, the team, every team does it differently. Like we said before, we have different HL styles. Some do a lot of pair programming, some do not so much. Um, we do, of course, a lot of Zoom meetings social work related pair programming via Zoom works surprisingly well. We also use collaboration tools a lot like uh, collaborative whiteboards that can be interacted with or recently added the code with me from JetBrains to our workflows so that you can actually work on the code together. Um, and it really helps, as Stefan said, that a lot of our work was distributed even before the crisis already, and teams had to coordinate the cross labs already a lot. Uh, so the, 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 the most important focus was to keep the spirit in the teams up, and I think that worked quite well. Yeah. Back to Lisa. <laughs> Back to Guzi, are there any plans to expand even further in Hagenberg? <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Let's see. Currently, we're physically bound, to be honest. But yeah. Um, let's say when I started Dynatrace, uh, uh, when I started in Dynatrace 2007, um, I got used to the, the noise of the construction work. To say it in that way, so um, yeah, we 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 like 
like with our software, we scale and and we are always looking for great talents and and um, and yeah. So there is potential in Heidelberg to expand, and for sure we will use that potential. Maybe we uh, took the question from the Zoom chat. Um, how difficult was it to move from Epmon, which was loved by customers already? Um, Uzi, you are our dinosaur. Maybe you can answer <laughs> us this question. As, as, I, please, are you <laughs> as, as, as I contributed a fair share of code uh, to Epmon back then in these times, um, um, Let's say it was a classical client server product, a very a tool. I would call it a, a solution, a tool, something like that. And with our second generation, we 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 provided ready-made use cases where we like directly pinpointed the issues and the root causes. And I don't want to say that worked in like in hundred percent of the cases. It's about 90, 80 percent cases. Our AI was really right. And it's also the next thing, the scale. So customers really like, so for the technical folks, so we really squeezed out every bits and piece of our Redmond solution, like CPU cycles, uh, less CPU cycles, less memory, like whatever. So the vertical scaling was really to the, I don't know what extent. And with the new product, so the second generation with what you can download from the cloud and which was on the cloud, we can scale horizontally. And there we are able, as Martin said before, to serve customers on a on a real big scale. And there were really say about 10K processes plus, or uh, let's say 10K hosts, and just assume they are all virtualized and having virtualizations, call it, okay, Docker is now going out of, <clears throat> is outdated somehow, but think of Kubernetes, think of whatever. So it's really the scale. So. In that case, it was not very difficult, but for sure, there were some Epmon lovers. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Guzi. And if you were to choose one process that have had a huge impact on Dynatrace growth, which one it would be? Um, I would say the it's not, it's not stated there, and I'm not sure if it's really a process. It's the autonomy. You probably heard that from Martin or so. Everyone's opinion is respected. However, it will be challenged. And this is, I think, yeah, what, what, what really, um, let's say, um, led to our growth. Back then when I started, um, um, let's say I was, I don't know, four to five offices away from Bern. And every time I, I changed something or something like that, it was challenged directly by Bern. And it was never like, okay, Bern said, do this or that. It was more, why? For sure he challenged that. And he gave input on that. But it was never like, this is my opinion and stick to it. It's challenged to be sure. So be, be, be assured that, that the, your opinion is challenged. And I think this is so far away from the process. As, as Martin said, some people do pair programming, some people don't like that. So why don't, so why put pressure of pair programming on that? But it's really like, okay, this autonomy style. So having your own opinions and always like uh, challenge them. This is, what really, I think, had the biggest impact. Yeah. Very cool. Um, and how do you keep the startup spirit in a company with 2K employees? Funny question. Yeah, um, for sure. Uh, let's say uh, in, in, in the, in the we shared some stories when we when we went public, um, and for example, what was very startup style is how we did our first testing. 
So um, there we have, <clears throat> to be honest, sometimes a bit fast releases. <laughs> like, okay, back then we had, we had um, one guy in the test automation. And if you overlook that, yeah, <clears throat> it went somehow online. And so <laughs> this is where we, let's say, did automate a lot more. <laughs> Uh, so we really, let's say, go away from the startup spirit, but it's really like, and this is where I came back to the previous question. Sorry about that. It's having this, this respect to opinions of everyone. They will be challenged. Yes. But it's not like that. So Martin says, Thomas says, Lisa says, um, Stefan says, these opinions are challenged and, and, and. This, this for me is the startup spirit because in a startup you're sitting next to each other and everyone has a deer and everyone is passing full of ideas and everything. But to be honest, as a startup, you have also to challenge these ideas. At the end, we will end up with ah, doing this, doing that, doing this, doing that, but you have no product at the end. So you need to challenge that. And this is how we uh, try to keep up the startup spirit. However, um, as Martin said, the cool thing is we are based, we are backed by a rock solid company. So um, this is this is uh, um, um, this 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 is this is also like a bonus <laughs> on that. Ah, the next thing is a is a cool question. <laughs> um, To be honest, I was in some customer calls where they said, "Okay, we built this. We 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 built this stuff on our on our own." And um, like, don't know, you use has it Logstash, Elastic, Kibana, you name it. That's super cool. That works perfectly for your home environment. To be honest. Um, I, I, I even do monitor my, my, my central heating system with Dynatrace um, because I want reliable notifications on my phone if something breaks. Um, if not, the house is cold. Um, and yeah, there are a lot of uh, like open source tools, um, different solutions, whatever. But once you have to rely on it, you need to call the professionals, to be honest. We're 1K engineering people on that. And honestly, I doubt you can build that on your own. It's like, it's like we do not build like these buildings by our own. That's not our core competency. There we have professionals for it. And the same is for monitoring. And or let's say software intelligence, then we are the professionals. Like we already discovered all the pitfalls <laughs> you will make. <laughs> and when it gets to reliable alerting and stuff like that. And to be honest, it's not fun to have a call in the middle of the night. Something is broken and your CEO will also be informed because there's a lot of money going down the, is it called going, going down the river? <laughs> I don't know if this is a proper English. So it's really going down the whatever. And they need to have the professionals. And so um, this is why we do the third generation. We want to be more open in there. We having different data sources in there uh, like that. But the soft intelligence platform, this is core. And this is where you can make the value out of it. And this is where you have to have reliable algorithms, as Thomas said, for example, forecasting and the scale. It's perfectly fine if you have two servers or something like that. You can download, I don't know, whatever. It will work. Dynatrace, by the way, works. But um, in the, in the, in the, in the um, how is it called? Um, when you scale, um, you need to have a professional tool. I want just 
little bit to add here because it explicitly mentions microservices and their monitoring possibilities, which includes all the open monitoring stacks that are popping up. I think they're very valuable input into any monitoring product, also into our, but again, this gives you a huge amount of data. And as soon as you have hundreds and thousands of servers, you will drown in data if you do it yourself. Or you have a very expensive team that does nothing else than that. And at that point, it's most likely more efficient to use us. And so for us, it's, it's, it's a great input and additional data source. So no, I don't think microservices and all those open uh, stacks will, will make us obsolete. No, definitely not. There's also one uh, interesting question in the Zoom chat. Any major changes in Dynatrace post solar and security, uh, security labs? Um, for sure, we, we were having like closer look on that. However, um, having, and you can Google that uh, later on, um, we have our secure development process, like uh, which we um, like, um oh our customers um this uh, secure development process like we have to set some several standards and therefore um um we how's it called um with this secure development process in place so we yeah we didn't suffer any uh issues by solar winds or stuff like that so this is, we need to assure to our customers that, let's say we prove that by the different means of, um, yeah, the, there are technical documents on that really uh, proving the stuff, but so, as Thomas said, we, 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 we lazy, we try to automate everything away. And this is also something like um, having the proper safeguards in place, having these, um, Formerly they were called CRC checks. So if you think of the old times, stuff like that, but yeah. Cool, uh, Thomas Stagel likes to talk. Um, Thomas, I can allow you to talk. So please go ahead. I'm totally sorry. I, I think I've just accidentally hit the, the uh, raise hand thing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> totally that's sorry. Fine. But yeah, at least I've talked a little bit. So sorry for interrupting it. <laughs> sorry. No, no worries. Good to have you here. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> then the next question uh, why having Hepkin days? Um, can you be a more, bit more precise <laughs> what you mean by hacking days? So we have like. Um, Maybe they mean our innovation days. Perhaps, I don't know. perhaps that so we have so we I, I can I can uh, um I can relate two things at first the innovation days so this is a dedicated time where you can spend um where you can like uh, pitch your idea and come together as a team and work on the team work on this idea so several cool things already evolved out of that we have that I uh, a few times per per year where we ah perfect yeah so this the innovation days yeah mm -hmm. so why or so we have them yes mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. it's really like um people like it um so you can spend some time on 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 like stuff you ever wanted to try and sometimes also some stuff for the product comes out so thomas perhaps you can i think you made this recommendation some stuff and uh... yeah yeah for example one year ago together with a colleague we we did as one of these innovation days um um how, how do we call it uh, monkey shifting so when when uh, some of the rfes are, are incoming we tried uh, we, we did a puc on how to leverage machine learning uh, to decide to which uh, pm or to which um 
uh, sales engineer, those questions should be routed. Yeah? So this, this kind of uh, this kind of stuff we uh, were trying out at Innovation Day. So just recently, one of our team members they built a Slack bot how to sort uh, incoming papers into this into certain Mendeley accounts to automatically automatically group them and, and things like that. Uh, that. That's what you can try on these Innovation Days. What we are the data science team do. Other teams are doing other really cool stuff there. Yeah, and, and, and as Stefan said. Uh, actually, qu quite a um, surprisingly high number of our cool internal tools came or started out as an innovation day project and evolved into something critical for our everyday operation in the meantime. So, mm -hmm. but we but we even like uh, um, fed Dynatrace data from our um, home. Can you call it home automation in an office building? Yeah, never mind. So you know, building, out the building automation. The building automation. So the building automation system of the of the business campus we are sitting in Hagenberg, we fed the data into um, like uh, Dynatrace, and also we did some um, web uh, overlay for it and stuff like that to be able to properly control that. So we fed a Raspberry Pi into it, and and or um, we did face recognition for our sweets uh, fridge. <laughs> So, because everyone was tired of like uh, putting in the name or something like, so just have to smile at the fridge, and uh, you, no, you not will be served then something, but you can take that and stuff like that. So this is also hacking day, mm -hmm. and I don't know if we will have uh, um, face recognition for uh, buying sweets in the in the um, in the Dynatrace product. Cool, cool. Any other questions? Because it looks like we've covered all of our questions. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, then. Yeah. Thanks again <laughs> for joining us today. Uh, thanks for the speakers. And I hope and we hope to see you all again next time. Thank you, everybody. And have a nice evening. Have nice a nice evening. evening. I see you. Whatever. Bye. Bye. Bye.